Hello and welcome to Live at State, the State Department's interactive virtual press briefing platform. I'm delighted to welcome participants joining us today from across Europe and around the globe. Today we'll be speaking with Ambassador Kurt Volker, U.S. Representative for Ukraine Negotiations. Before I turn it over to Ambassador Volker for some opening remarks, I'd like to make a few comments on procedures for questions. You can start submitting your questions now in the Questions tab at the top of your screen. If you see someone else ask a question you would also like us to answer, you can upvote it by clicking uh, the Like button to the right of that question. We will try to answer as many as we can, but our time is limited today, so please vote to indicate the questions you would most like us to cover. If you would like to receive a transcript of today's briefing and links to broadcast quality audio and video files, please fill out the short survey by clicking on the Polls tab at the top of the event page. With that, let's get started. Ambassador Volker, thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had the honor of being in Ukraine on Monday last week for the inauguration of President Zelensky, part of a U.S. presidential delegation that was led by the Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry, and we were joined also by the EU Ambassador, uh, United States Ambassador of the European Union, Gordon Sondland, and also Senator Ron Johnson. Uh, I, uh, we were thrilled with the quality of the election in Ukraine. It was a free and fair election. We were impressed with the uh, peaceful transition of power from one uh, incumbent to a new elected president. And uh, we continue to stand by Ukraine in its development of its democracy, its economy, its security, and of course its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, president Zelensky ran a campaign promising a far-reaching reform in Ukraine that clearly was welcomed by many of the people. He received 73 percent of the vote, and that is something that uh, we in the United States also strongly support. Uh, Ukraine needs to go through thoroughgoing reform and particularly to fight corruption in order to strengthen its economy, to be a welcoming place for foreign investment, and to become the kind of country that is producing uh, well-being for its citizens and is a magnet for the regions that Russia has currently taken uh, with the hope that they can be peacefully reintegrated into the rest of Ukraine again. Uh, with that, I'd be very happy to take questions. Great. Our first question um, was submitted by Andrei Tsaplienka from OnePlus One in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. How does the war in Donbass affect Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic perspectives, given the presidency of Zelensky? Would there be a chance to join the NATO alliance if the ongoing war in eastern Ukraine does not end in the coming decades? Well, several things about that. First off, uh, all of us in uh, the United States and in Europe are deeply concerned about the ongoing conflict. Uh, it is a humanitarian tragedy for the people of the Donbas. They need as much support and assistance as can be delivered by the Ukrainian government and by the international community. And all of this is happening because of Russia's invasion and occupation and continued fighting inside Ukraine. Uh, and Ukrainians are still killed on an average of every week, which is a, a terrible tragedy. Uh, so we are all concerned about solving that, that, uh, that crisis, that war. Um, as far as Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations goes, we strongly stand behind uh, Ukraine's aspirations. It has a lot of work to do in every sector, whether it's in uh, the strengthening of democratic institutions, in fighting corruption, in the economy, uh, and in the case of NATO, also building interoperability and reforming the defense sector and contributing to common security in Europe as a whole. With that, of course, uh, the fact that Russia occupies part of Ukraine and there is fighting going on in Ukraine is a concern, and countries would not, countries in NATO, would not want to be taking on a conflict. At the same time, I think it provides the wrong uh, message to Russia that all it has to do is attack a country and that country can no longer be considered for NATO membership. Uh, I think we uh, want to make clear that we continue to support the commitment made in 2008 in Bucharest that Ukraine will one day be a member of NATO. We want to work together with Ukraine to address all of the challenges that it faces to make it as, as good a position as possible for Ukraine. And we hope that when NATO is again ready to look at further enlargement, that Ukraine will also be ready. Our next question comes from Vladimir Yermakov at Interfax. Are you planning to have contacts with Russia in the near future? And what issues need to be discussed? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, yes, I would like to have contact with Russia in the near future. I don't know what form that will take at the moment. 
Uh, we have just gotten through the presidential election in Ukraine. We've immediately launched into a parliamentary election campaign. And uh, so far, in, in contacts we had earlier this year, uh, the Russians made clear that they did not see an opportunity for uh, productive discussions during the course of the presidential campaign. Uh, we'll have to see how it stands now during the course of this parliamentary campaign and when an appropriate time would be to, to meet and to follow up. As far as the topics go, of course, the main one is the war in the Donbass. Uh, we want to make sure that we are putting on the table all of the issues about Minsk implementation, starting with a ceasefire, a withdrawal of foreign forces, the disarming of illegal uh, armed groups, and a creating a situation of security in the Donbass so that additional political steps that are also part of Minsk can be taken. And these include amnesty for people who've committed crimes as part of the conflict, uh, implementing a special status for the region under Ukraine's constitution, holding local elections, and of course eventually the reintegration, the peaceful reintegration of this territory uh, with the rest of Ukraine. Those are the topics to discuss. Uh, Russia has a, a lot that it needs to do to implement the Minsk agreements. So far it is not. Ukraine also has its responsibilities and we would want to see where we stand and whether we can make progress. Our next question from Sergei Strokhan at Kommersant in Russia. What should be done to revive the Minsk process? And what realistic forms of pressure could the U.S. put on Ukraine to get it to comply with its responsibilities under the Minsk Accords? Well, Ukraine has passed legislation that uh, would provide amnesty for people who committed crimes as part of the conflict. It has passed legislation that would provide for special status. Uh, it has held elections throughout the rest of Ukraine and would do so in uh, the Donbass as well if we're able to access the territory. Unfortunately, the problem with Minsk implementation is Russia's continued occupation of eastern Ukraine and the ongoing fighting there, so it's impossible for Ukraine to go any further than it already has. Meanwhile, Russia has yet to fully implement a ceasefire to withdraw its forces, uh, foreign forces that are in Ukraine, uh, to uh, support the disbanding of the illegal armed groups that are there, uh, to disband the people's republics that are there, which have no place under Ukraine's constitution and are not part of the Minsk agreements. So there's a lot that Russia has to do to stop the war in Ukraine so that we can get on with the other aspects of full implementation of Minsk. It's very much what we want to do. Our next question comes from Patrick Tucker at Defense One here in the United States. What are your concerns about the Russian military buildup on the Crimean Peninsula, both in terms of the future of the Black Sea and the conflict in Ukraine? What does that imply for the future of restoring Crimea to Ukraine? Well, first off, let me be clear. Uh, the United States does not and will not recognize you, uh, Crimea's uh, claimed annexation by Russia. Um, we have put in place uh, under Secretary Pompeo a long-term policy of refusing to recognize this, and we have sanctions in place as a result, and that's not going to change. Now, Russia, of course, physically controls the territory of Crimea, and it's not a surprise that they have increased their military deployments in that area as well. But as far as the situation in Ukraine or the situation in the Black Sea more broadly, uh, Russia is already there. It has a Black Sea coastline. It has a very powerful military. It has deployed that military inside Russian territory, recognized Russian territory surrounding Ukraine. And the additional deployments in Crimea don't make a fundamental change to that large Russian presence that's already there. Our next question from Andrei Sitov at the TASS news agency in Russia. You highly praised former President Poroshenko before the elections, and even visited a U.S. Navy ship with him. But the Ukrainians have rejected him and his policies. Will this be reflected in the U.S. approach to Kyiv? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your question. And I would repeat today what I said then, which is that uh, President Poroshenko did a tremendous job on reform in Ukraine, more in the four years that he was president than in the preceding 20 years. It's also true, we support democracy, we support free and fair elections, the rights of the Ukrainian people to choose their leaders, and they voted for more. They wanted more reform, more change, more rapid change, a new generation. And so with that, they voted for President Zelensky, and just as we worked very closely together with the previous uh, president and government in Ukraine, uh, we intend to work very closely with President Zelensky and his team on furthering that same agenda of uh, reform and progress and development of Ukraine. Our next question comes from Pyotr Koslov at BBC News Russian. 
Uh, Viktor Medvedchuk uh, quit the Minsk negotiations process where he was representing Ukraine. What is your reaction? Have you discussed with President Zelensky who is going to be his representative? Uh, thank you. I have not discussed with President Zelensky who his choices are. I do support, however, his right to make those choices. Having been elected as president, uh, it is his responsibility to oversee Ukraine's participation in the Minsk process and aiming at having the territory restored to Ukraine. And it is his choice who he wants to be his representatives. And, and we will work with him and uh, those individuals as uh, much as we can. Our next question comes from Natalia Chudakova at RFERL. How will the U.S. react to Russia giving passports to Ukraine citizens in occupied Donbass? The U.N. court declared that the Ukrainian sailors detained by the Russian authorities must be released. Um, how can this decision be enforced? Uh, first off, on the sailors, uh, we completely support the court decision. There is no legal reason for Russia to continue to hold these sailors. Uh, they were attacked illegally in international waters. They were taken illegally to Russia. Uh, they should be treated as uh, members of a foreign government's military forces. There is no basis to hold them inside Russia. We do urge their immediate release. Uh, the courts have also ruled in that direction. Russia has made clear it has no intention of doing that, which is uh, a shame for those people and for their families. And we do hope that, that uh, Russia has a change of heart on this. Uh, that being said, there's, there's no force that's going to be applied to Russia to make them follow uh, uh, the rule of law and to make them follow this court decision. Um, but it is our very clear position that they need to release these sailors. Uh, the first part of the question was, was about the pa reaction to Russia's plans to give passports right. to uh, well, first of all, that's a very provocative step for Russia to take, to uh, go forward and say we will give passports, Russian passports, to the citizens of another country. Uh, that being said, I don't think Ukrainians are going to be rushing to take up these passports. Uh, they are suffering a lot under Russia's occupation in the Donbas as it is. And uh, we also will be looking at whether uh, we are in a position to identify and not recognize those passports, as we do in the case of passports issued in Crimea already. Our next question comes from Andriy Tseplienka at OnePlus One in Ukraine. Will the U.S. continue to supply lethal weapons to Ukraine? And are there any particular systems on the table? Uh, thank you again for the questions. Um, Ukraine, as any other country in the world, has a right to self-defense. That is a right enshrined in the UN Charter. Uh, for some reason, uh, there was a, a decision here in the previous administration not to help Ukraine with its defensive capabilities, at least lethal defensive capabilities. Uh, that is something that has now been lifted, and the United States is prepared to work with Ukraine, just as we do with countries around the world, in supporting their legitimate defense needs. As you know, we've provided foreign military financing approved by the Congress. Um, that has produced uh, support for systems such as anti-tank systems and anti-sniper systems. And just as we do with many countries, we will be consulting with Ukraine about what their legitimate needs are. Uh, we will be looking at what capabilities we can help provide. We also are open to foreign military sales. Uh, that is to say, Ukraine purchasing military equipment from the United States. And this is all part of the normal course of business for a country developing its own defensive capabilities. And in Ukraine's case, it is particularly important because it is under attack every day. And so it has a desperate need to strengthen it, these defensive capabilities and prevent any further loss of territory, hold the line, and hopefully create the conditions where peace can again be negotiated. Next question comes from Konstantin Vasilkevich at the 2000 Weekly Newspaper in Ukraine. You said that Donbas residents are Ukrainian citizens. What should Ukraine do to support them? Is there any feasible interaction now between the Ukrainian authorities and authorities in the so-called DPR and LPR um, in order to help the people who live under their control? Well, again, thank you for that question. I believe that uh, assisting the people in the Donbas and providing humanitarian relief to them is one of the most important tasks that, that needs to be addressed by both the Ukrainian government and the international community more broadly. Uh, many things can be done. Everything from mine clearance in areas that where Ukraine actually has control to improving the safety of boundary crossings between the occupied area and the rest of Ukraine, uh, facilitating the delivery of pensions to those who are unable to collect them themselves, 
making sure that uh, services are connected and continuing, things like electricity and phone service, uh, gas, water, uh, ensuring the safety of these as much as possible. Uh, these are all things where, with the support of international humanitarian organizations, I believe more can be done. Uh, I was heartened to see that uh, President Zel uh, Zelensky talked about this as well, and I hope that uh, through the course of parliamentary elections and establishing a government uh, after those elections that there will be more opportunities from the Ukrainian side to reach out to them. Another question from Andrei Sitov at the TASS News Agency. On his recent visit to Russia, Secretary Pompeo did not raise the subject of Ukraine at all. How do you explain this lack of interest? Have you received or asked for new instructions from the Secretary? Do you have a free hand on this? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, First off, the Secretary did raise it with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. He did not bring it up in the meeting with President Putin. Uh, the purpose of these meetings, as you know, the relationship with Russia is in extremely difficult circumstances right now. He wanted to make a, a, a particularly focused discussion about arms control and about the situation in Iran and in Venezuela. And he did raise the issue of Ukraine with Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, it is also an important priority for the United States and thank you very much for the question. I am I'm, uh, meeting with Secretary Pompeo immediately after this uh, briefing, and we are very much in alignment about where U.S. strategy lies. Our next question, there's several questions in here from Roman uh, Oliarchik at the Financial Times. Um, did you advise President Zelensky not to appoint Andrei Bogdan? Are there concerns about this and Kolomoisky's influence or recommendations to Zelensky, for example, on uh, default on foreign debt? Does the Trump administration share Rudy Giuliani's concern about Mr. Zelensky's entourage? And what are your impressions of President Zelensky in general? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first off, uh, we were very impressed with President Zelensky's stated commitment to reform and thoroughgoing reform in Ukraine, fighting corruption, creating a, a Ukrainian leadership that serves the interests of the people of Ukraine. Uh, he was very clear about that in the discussions that the U.S. delegation had with him during the course of the inauguration. Uh, during the course of our meetings with President Zelensky, we also made clear that he needs to pay close attention to his own credibility and his own ability to carry out those tasks. That he, he, the Ukrainian voters who voted for him, 73% of the voters, now have very high expectations. And so with that in mind, he should pay attention to uh, what image he conveys, what messages he conveys, how he gets started in business. We did not give any specific advice about individuals because we are focused on the principles of governance and on the policies that he executes. And with President Zelensky's stated commitment to reform in Ukraine, fighting corruption, reforming the justice system, rule of law, uh, we fully support those principles and those policies and look forward to continuing to work with him. Our next question from the Kiev Post. The U.S. Senate proposes increasing its defense aid to Kyiv in the fiscal year 2020 to $300 million, and particularly to provide Ukraine with shipwreck missiles and coastal defense systems. Can you please specify the names of the weapons that the U.S. intends to send to Ukraine next year? Uh, I, I wish I could, but unfortunately I do not know the names of the specific systems. I do know that uh, the process here is one where the Congress uh, appropriates the funding Pentagon sits down with Ukrainian uh, defense leadership. We talk through exactly what the needs are, how uh, they should be addressed, and what systems are best in doing so. I don't have any specific systems to talk about today. Our next question is from Dmitro, uh, Dmitro Shurko at the National News Agency of Ukraine. It is clear that Zelensky is trying to stop the war in Donbass. There's a public discussion inside Ukraine about quote-unquote red lines. From the U.S. perspective, what are the red lines to continue supporting Ukraine and maintain sanctions against Russia? Well, I think the most important red line is continued efforts to implement the Minsk Agreement. Um, this means, to begin with, a ceasefire, a withdrawal of heavy weapons, uh, removal of foreign forces, and Russia continues to maintain substantial forces there. Uh, a removal of illegal armed groups, which are occupying the Donbass right now, and uh, prece proceeding with creating security for all the people and then implementing the political aspects of Minsk. Things that would go against that would be any recognition 
of the seizure of this territory by Russia or that it is in some way independent. Uh, autonomy is not a part of the Minsk agreements. It is a special status and that is something to be developed still, um, but it is not full autonomy. And uh, a continued presence of foreign forces on Ukrainian territory would also be a red line. Uh, so these are all things that I think are uh, part of the Minsk agreements. There's nothing new that needs to be added here, but what we do need to see is that it is implemented. I think we have time for uh, two last quick questions from Pyotr Koslov at BBC News Russian. When is the next Volker Surkov meeting going to take place and where? And when President Zelensky is ready to, when is President Zelensky going to be ready to join the for, Normandy format? Um, when is the next meeting of the format participants going to take place? Uh, we addressed these questions a little bit earlier in the call, but just to come back. So we will have some initial contacts with Russia to see whether now is the right time for getting together to talk about uh, Minsk implementation and where we can go from here. Prior to the completion of the presidential election, Russia had indicated that it was not prepared uh, at that moment. We do hope that uh, there will be an opportunity ahead, but it may be uh, after the parliamentary elections. We'll have to see, uh, and we'll be in touch with Russia about that. As far as the Normandy format goes, that is a process led by France and Germany. We fully support it. We track it very closely. Uh, they have had discussions about the possibility of a Normandy format meeting. Uh, possibly as soon as July. I don't think anything yet has been scheduled, and that would, of course, require agreement not only by Ukraine, but also by Russia. We're going to get in one more question quickly coming from Hungary. Is there any progress in NATO to get Hungary to lift its veto for conducting meetings of the NATO-Ukraine Commission? Unfortunately, there has not been any progress on that to date. Uh, I do hope that with the election of President Zelensky, and, and let me remind that he is a native Russian language speaker, who also speaks Ukrainian, uh, that um, there needs to be an agreement between Hungary and Ukraine on how to deal with the question of national minorities, the rights of those minorities to speak and to have education in their own language, and at the same time to ensure that the citizens of Ukraine, all of them, also learn and use Ukrainian as part of their uh, communications and their official language in the country. Uh, that needs to be resolved. Uh, I think that Hungary is making a mistake by using uh, NATO as a, as a tool to try to put pressure on this issue. Uh, Ukraine faces important external challenges, the attack and the invasion and the occupation by Russia. That is something that should be concern, of concern to every NATO ally, including Hungary. And blocking uh, high-level meetings between NATO and Ukraine, I believe, is a mistake, even while I support the notion of dialogue and resolution of the, of the issues concerning the Hungarian minority's use of their language. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up the program for today, uh, sir? As always, I, I want to come back one more time to the point of the people of the Donbas. They are Ukrainian citizens. They are suffering tremendously as a result of Russia's invasion and occupation. Uh, they need humanitarian support. We are uh, pleased that President Zelensky has uh, already spoken about this issue. We look forward to working with him and his team uh, on reform and development in Ukraine, on Minsk implementation, on strengthening security for Ukraine, and uh, raising the humanitarian standards for the people of the Donbas and indeed the well-being of all the people of Ukraine. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. So thank you again for your questions to our participants, and thank you, Ambassador Volker, for joining us today. To those who participated in today's conference, if you would like to clip audio or video from the program, we will send you links to broadcast quality files momentarily. We will also provide a transcript as soon as it is available. If you would like to receive any of these products, please remember to fill out the survey located in the Polls tab at the top of the event page. Thank you again for your participation, and we hope you can join us for another briefing again soon.